Hey, this is Michael Emery. Thanks for tuning into the Slow Baja. This podcast is powered by Tequila Fortaleza, handmade in small batches, and hands down, my favorite tequila. Slow Baja is brought to you by the Baja XL Rally. The Baja XL is the largest and longest amateur off-road rally on the Baja Peninsula. It's 10 epic days, LA to Cabo, back to LA, mostly on dirt. For an adventure of a lifetime, you got to check out the Baja XL Rally. More information at BajaXL.org and on Facebook at the Baja XL Rally News and Support Group. It's coming up January 2021. Be there. Hey, this is Michael Emery, the Slow Baja Podcast, and I'm in Fallbrook, California with David Keir today, and we are talking about the Peninsula of Happiness. <laughs> So you've been going to Baja since you were a kid. You were just starting to tell me before uh, I turned the, the recorder on about how your dad was a dentist and a fisherman, an avid fisherman, and had a, a customer, a client who said, you know, you need to start going to Baja and you need to fish in Baja. And your dad said, nah, you know, I can't go down there in a Jeep. I've got wife and kids. And all of a sudden he's got a Wagoneer. It's a little bit of a plush off-roader and you were on your way. You were sitting between mom and dad, logging the mileage and uh, telling your dad where to go. That's pretty much it. They uh, made me the navigator and uh, with a copy of Ur- of the uh, Lower California Guidebook by Gerhard and Gulick, which was known as the Baja Bible back in the day. And, um, and I would tell them uh, what was coming up ahead on the road and which way to turn if necessary. And uh, that's how the memory of Baja, even though I was just a young kid, uh, was etched into my mind because I did all of that recording and visual uh reconnoiting of the land compared to what the book said and so i have a great memory of baja california travel uh, before the highway was paved in the 1960s and i've carried that through today to keep that memory of the old glory days of baja alive for the new people that have no concept of what it was like what it was like to take two weeks to drive to la paz compared to two days right so what was your first uh trip south with your parents the first trip we took was to gonzaga bay uh, we went south from San Felipe, and um, uh, when we stopped at uh, Pertecitos, which is a little fishing camp, uh, a gringo bar, if you will, uh, the people there said, oh, the road ends here. You can't go any further. And uh, my dad said nuts to that, and uh, we put it in four-wheel drive, and we made it to Gonzaga Bay and about five hours later, and that was wonderful. So did he have any experience off-roading here in in San Diego area? Did he get into the desert and just say, I'm going to learn how to do this? Or is he just a man of adventure and said, you know what, I've got the right tool. I'm bringing my wife and kids and we're going to figure it out as we go. That was pretty much it. He uh, was not afraid of anything. And uh, we learned how to use four-wheel drive pretty quick uh, from that trip on. And going to Gonzaga Bay back in the 60s, that was considered the toughest road in Baja at the time because uh, it was low range crawling up and down very steep grades. And uh, you, you, you learn or you, you die, basically. <laughs> Wow. All right. And how did your mom take it? She was great. She uh, she uh, went got right into it right off the bat, and uh, she has a fascination with history. Uh, when we would see old graves or in later trips mission sites, uh, she was right there and just absorbed by by the history. And I guess that's what rubbed off to me onto me. My father with the four wheel driving and the fish and the fishing, and my mom with the historical uh, interest. So obviously that uh, uh, that apple didn't fall far from the tree. Exactly. <laughs> so, so how did it progress from your first trip fishing in Gonzaga Bay and then on to uh, I know just from um, following you on social media that you were into some of the earlier Baja races. Exactly. Earlier right. in the well, 70s. It, sure. As soon as I turned 16, uh, we had a, a street legal Myers Manx dune buggy. It was my first car to take to high school. So uh, it was a Baja vehicle. And uh, that oh, was. I, I like your dad already. Yeah, that's that's how we began. As, I, as soon as I turned 16, my parents knew I knew enough Spanish and I was a responsible kid that they could trust me. So they signed the permission slip as you need to have before, until you're 18 to go to Baja. So a friend and I did our first Baja trip when I was 16, and uh, that was in 74. Um, and then uh, Baja off-road racing was interesting to me. My dad and I actually went to the first uh, Baja 1000 because it had been the Nora Mexican 1000 right. up until 1973 when the Mexican government decided they were going to switch things up and run the race themselves, which they did for one year. 
And I was at that race, the 73 1000. And I loved off-road racing because it, it combined the, the beauty and wonders of Baja with the off-roading and both four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive uh, driving over those roads. And uh, in 1974, my mom and I went down to Mike Sky Ranch for the first SCORE race, which is called the Baja Internacional, also known as the Baja 500, but they couldn't legally call it the 500 for a few years because Nora held on to that name. And uh, score, I went to the all the score races pretty much after that. And uh, at one of the races, uh, someone was at a pit nearby and said, would you like to hold a fire extinguisher for us? And I said, sure. So I became uh, a helper at a pit for a group called Los Campeones. It's a racing team that was out of Vista, California. And that's how I got connected. And after a few years, I was a pit captain at several races, and I got invited to be a co-driver in the 1979 Baja 1000. Wow. So that was great. Wow. <laughs> so as a co-driver, you're in the navigator seat reading the route book and trying not to get sick, I'm assuming. It's yeah, got to well, be we, like uh, yeah, crazy. That, I, I did get sick, but that, it wasn't from the racing. It was from just way too much Negra Modelo the night before. Okay. Well, that's a hazard of racing in Mexico. <laughs> I, I'm... I, well aware of those hazards. <laughs> Pre-race celebration. We didn't get very far. The differential okay. blew up on us, leaving Ensenada, going up towards Ojos Negros. But uh, I had uh, a month earlier pre-run the race course, which was going to be my portion, which was San Matias Pass through Gonzaga Bay to El Crucero. So I just done that, and I did it in my Subaru four-wheel drive wagon, which I had in 79. Wow. And uh, the road was really, really bad shape south of Puerto Cidos. My exhaust system is still there somewhere in the rocks. <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> and so I came home in sure. a very noisy Subaru wagon. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So from those days in the 70s and heading down there um, as, a, as a youngster in high school, which is just great that, you know, parents – we're not helicopter parents in those days. They'd hey, give you something super dangerous like a Myers Manx and then say, hey, take that down to Mexico. I love it. Um, obviously, the bond was formed early. And what kept you coming back? Uh, needing to see more what was over that hill, uh, what was uh, in that canyon. It was much like what Earl Stanley Gardner claimed what drew him to Baja to wonder what was behind what he could see because the, the road down through Baja was, you know, one spot, but there was mountains and canyons and who knows what lay behind those hidden passageways. So I was the same way. I wanted to see where those dirt roads went to and also to kind of re-record as things changed. So I started documenting uh, the areas I went to by drawing maps of them. And I got real interested in drawing maps. And I actually had inspired to be a cartographer when wow. I grew up more. <laughs> but wow. from from time I was a kid, I was drawing maps of places we went camping to. Amazing. So do you want to hit a few highlights for me? Tell me about some of the places if you were going to jump in your Toyota truck today and throw some camping gear in and head to Baja as if it were open and you could do that legally. <laughs> uh, we're talking in the times of... Uh, Corona, we're still under shelter in place. Although being in San Diego doesn't feel like people are sheltering much anymore. They're at no, the, they're we, at the beach yesterday, and I ate in yeah. a restaurant. You know, we did too. Yeah, the first time great. in two months. It's just yeah. terrific. Felt so great to just order chips and guacamole and <laughs> sit in a restaurant with people. It, it was wonderful. Yeah, I was missing uh, some sushi, so I had that uh, yesterday, <laughs> and and street tacos. So where would you go? If you were going to jump in your truck now. Our first choice, and we would have gone this past weekend uh, if it hadn't been for what's going on with the uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, would be to what I call Shell Island. Okay. And it's a beautiful sand beach. It's a barrier island that is separated from the rest of Baja by a long, narrow lagoon and a, and a deep mud field, unless the tide's really high, and it actually is an island surrounded by water. And this is about 20 miles south of San Felipe, and there's nothing else there because you can't develop a place that's in the, in the tidal zone of Mexico. So it's a great place to, to dry camp, to be in the sand dunes and not need any facilities whatsoever. So that's our f number one choice for camping. It's only uh, five or six hours away right. from where I live, and we can just be on our own, uh, quiet. The birds just going by, the ocean is going in and out with the tides. It's wonderful. Wow. Sounds lovely. Sounds lovely. I like that area between uh, San Felipe and Puerto Cidos. And uh, Ted and I spent a little bit of time um, driving, I guess we were driving north on the east side after the Baja XL rally in January of 19. And we came all the way up the 
East Peninsula. I saw those photos. And those were, yes. That was just it's it's an area that really speaks to me, and I really would like to get back and spend more time poking around there. Um, one of the towns that's always fascinated me, and I'd love to get your take on it before we get on to the missions, um, Santa Rosalia. Tell tell me about. What do you know about Santa Rosalia well, and, and I, the broken down, you know, factories that are right there on the main road out, and and it just fascinates me. There's that place. there's two Santa Rosalias, and we were introduced to the first one in 1966 uh, on our trip down to the tip of Baja, which was our the, our great adventure in our Jeep Wagoneer, and uh, then it was a very sad looking, dirty, dusty mining town. Um, it, it had no appeal whatsoever, and uh, the the thing to do was get gasoline if you could and get out of there as quickly as you can, okay. the way, way my parents would describe it. Because right. it is a mining, it was a copper mining town, right. and uh, it just wasn't very appealing. Now, of course, in years since then, it's been you know cleaned up, if you will, uh, made into quite a neat destination. The, the church uh, designed by uh, Gustav Eiffel is an attraction there, the Black Sand Beach, uh, the bakery, you know, so it has its charm for sure. And a couple of nice hotels are uh, just south of town. Though. So, yeah, it's it's totally changed from the way I first saw Santa Rosalia to the way it is today. I first saw it in 1986, uh, heading to Mulahe, I guess, and reading about it in a guidebook and just saying, this is a place you've got to get the bread, which the bread was already sold out, but we got some <laughs> some pastries or whatever when we were there. And um, it was interesting. And it's always just sort of stuck in my head, you know, those decrepit, big, um, factories right on the this main drag there, right on the the highway, just made me think if this was anywhere else, those would already be turned into some sort of boutique hotel or something. You know, they're right yeah. across from the it's, water with you know great views and it's special because it's, it's not a Me- it's in Mexico, but it's not a Mexican town. It's right. a French town exactly. Now there's newer infrastructure that's yeah. Mexican oriented, but right. boy, you know, from the late 1800s to the mid 1900s, that's all French style uh, construction and building in there. Yeah, built out of wood that was shipped from wherever, you know, up the coast of California, I'd assume. Um, Okay, so your great family adventure. Let's jump on that because that, again, I wish my dad had been that adventurous. The the trip to the tip you're talking about? Yeah, the trip to the tip. So after after a a year of uh, going to, we went to Gonzaga Bay a couple times and and, uh, went south of San Felipe for surf fishing, uh, to uh, it was called Agua de Chale in those days, uh, but the uh, a fellow who had developed a camp there named Luis uh, renamed it Nuevo Mazatlan because he wanted to sound more touristy, and uh, so that's where we'd camp and we'd go uh, fishing, surf fishing near there. And uh, after a few of those trips, we started wanting to see more of Baja. I said, "Well, the big deal is to you know to drive to Cabo San Lucas and then go to La Paz and take the ferry across because after 800 miles of dirt roads, you you wanted some pavement to come back home on." So uh, we did that. I think it was at least two weeks of the trip, and I remember much of it. Um, driving down Highway One, the pavement ended before you got to Colonnette, so about eighty some miles below Ensenada. The pavement just ended, and my dad said, "Okay, now the v- adventure begins." Hmm. And uh, and it was a uh, you know pretty washboardy graded road until you get to the San Quentin area. Then it started to degradate down to more of a a natural dirt road and a steep drop off into El Rosario was pretty uh, wild because it was a very steep canyon and you had to stop and listen before you drove down it to make sure no cars were coming up because there's no place to pass for that two miles or so going yeah, down. Yeah, so you're using your senses there that people don't use anymore. Uh, so you'd listen to see if somebody was chugging their way up right. the, and look for dust trails or what have you uh bad roads good people mama espinosa so you must have actually met her when she was running her, her yeah restaurant. i don't that trip i don't remember her okay. or that we stopped there necessarily there were two gas sources there one is where the baja cactus is now mm-hmm. the Pamex station and then the pump in front of mama espinosa's so i'm not sure where we where we topped off there i'm sure we must have but um, it was after the high was paved uh, in 1973 that uh, Mama Espinosa uh, coined that phrase that everyone's very uh, famous or knowledgeable about. Bad roads bring good people, and good roads bring all kinds of people. Okay. 
<laughs> so uh, yeah, so I just remember that you know we'd gone out and we camped at different spots along the way, like Agua Dulce, a famous spring on the El Camino Real, and the old main road went right by it, and we actually camped the night there. And I've been back there a few times since then to kind of remember. Oh yeah, we camped here, and there's a there's a ranch on the site now, but it's a big water hole and the only good water supply for many miles to the missionaries and the Indians and all the travelers uh, coming up through Baja. The gold mine, uh, the 49ers, came right. up through Baja as well. And was your dad much of a photographer? Did he have, no. you didn't have the, you don't have a. <laughs> he always managed to cut our heads off or <laughs> got the left or right side of us. Uh, it wasn't right. the greatest photographer, sorry. So you don't have a box of uh, Kodachrums uh, of those early trips? Well, I do because, you know, my mom took some or I might have taken some. Okay. So I've got a few old pictures uh, that, uh, yeah, it's still some memories. And how was your Spanish in those days? Did you, did you have enough to get by? I don't think there was very much at all. Uh, and uh, it was. Either hand motions or there's enough English known that, and you, there wasn't a lot of human interaction back in those days because sure. you'd stop, uh, you might, they might want to stop. Like at, I remember Rancho San Agustin was famous for having a kerosene refrigerator, so they had cold beer and, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah. So you go in and you, you give them a peso or whatever, and they give you the soda or the beer, and you didn't even know very much Spanish in those days. And highlights of that trip, I mean, tell me what it must have been like for you to see the first mission or see that first uh, oasis or, you know, what what was it that sticks out? Yeah, I there the one oasis that really seemed to be phenomenal to me was Comandu, mm -hmm. because that was on the old main road to La Paz. It didn't go through Loreto. So south of the Bahia Concepcion, the road went inland and through San Jose and San Miguel de Comandu. And uh, that was uh, just beautiful because it's all lava mesas and desert. And then you drop down in this beautiful Palm Canyon, much the way you experience coming into San Ignacio, the same right. kind of beauty. Um, and uh, there was a little activity going on along, along the side of the road in Comandu. And they were having a little fiesta. They invited us to, to stop and stay. So we got out and they were cooking a turtle. Wow. Uh, they uh, making a turtle stew and they had the turtle shell that they're actually cooking in with the chopped up meat and adding vegetables and they invite us to stay and and my parents kind of politely declined it was too exotic i guess for them so i don't know if we'd ever had a chance to eat turtle back when it was legal yeah. and okay to eat turtle sure yeah well times change <laughs> yep it's supposed to be very tasty but yeah times times do change um, and on that note, turtles, turtle rescue has always been fascinating to me ever since I first saw Jacques Cousteau on TV saying, like baby turtles returning to the sea, the cycle of life continues. Have you spent any time, there used to be a turtle rescue place, was it Bahia de Los Angeles? Yes, it was. Antonio, a fellow right. that ran that, he yeah. had passed away in recent years. Uh, his wife Betty maintains their camp there by the, the old turtle um, uh, rescue facility and I've got a great photograph of Antonio handing my my well she's my girlfriend at the time but my wife now a baby turtle so I got a picture of her holding the, the baby turtle if his, if his uh, fl flippers flapping is that mm -hmm. right yeah and uh, it was cute so that's all gone now but right. the turtle rescue tanks were we always would visit that back in the early 2000s and it was Bahia de Los Angeles that, yes. that was there yeah just north of town is right where his place was and the turtle habitat. I'm sorry to pin you down on turtles. So I don't. We got we got off the, off the subject here, but I I always consider um, Todos Santos in that area to be more rich with turtle life. Is it is there turtle life on the Sea of Cortez and I mean are turtles up there? Do you know? Yeah, sorry, Sea of Cortez. Used feel to be, free to say no. We'll cut this no, part no, out. No, that's okay. <laughs> the Matt, turtle turtle fishing and hunting, if you will, uh, at the time was pretty active all the way up to uh, uh, Bahia San Luis Gonzaga. Uh, it was was uh, turtles were harvested by fishermen, and L.A. Bay was a big turtle uh, source, and turtle trucks would bring the turtles from there to Ensenada on regular weekly drives over the dirt roads of the day. And matter of fact, one of the off-road racers, I think it was actually Steve McQueen, because all the Hollywood actors would love to go off-road racing back in the old Baja race days. He actually, when he broke down, if I'm correct if it was Steve McQueen or... Um, anyway would actually had to ride on back of some turtles and a turtle truck to get back to uh, to where he could get a normal ride uh, back to Ensenada. So, wow, that's a story yeah. I'm going to have to find the uh, yeah. find the details on. Right. It, it was either Steve McQueen or one of the other uh, actors who loved to go racing in Baja. Mm -hmm. I've seen James Garner's car, and I think that's just interesting to think that those uh, racers, those actors in those days also took up 
Baja racing when it was just sort of a macho thing you get out. And yeah, it was great. Well, in matter of fact, when uh, Bill Strop uh, teased Parnelli Jones that he wasn't man enough to race Baja, the race off road, because he had no interest in in, in, a, in a sort of the kids dirt road race, and boy, that got Parnelli all worked up. And look what's happened with yeah. him in off road yeah, racing. Yeah, he's the one of the founding fathers. <laughs> yeah, Pete Brock, he got off deep into. Uh, Baja racing as well. Just loved it from, you know, his sports car days and working with Carroll Shelby. And, you know, recently, I don't know if he had a prominent role in Ford versus Ferrari, but he was one of those guys making cars that went to Le Mans and then, you know, just got off deep in Baja and found it was like the most challenging thing you could do in a race car. Baja has a way of, of uh, I don't know, infecting you with the, uh, what I call the Baja bug. Because uh, once it gets into your system, you, you can't shake it. You just have to go back again and again. That's the only. That's the only treatment. There's no cure for Baja fever. So tell me, we're, we're looking at a stack of of books here, and the first one appears to me like it could have been done by David Keir when he was in middle school or in high school. It yeah, looks like, that's um, it's like a. It looks like a report on Baja. I was. And fift- the, I was 15 years old. And the Trans Peninsular Highway. How 15 years old? So one more time, you told me when we first uh, arrived when you were born. But tell the tell our listeners. Fifteen years old. This would have been well, nineteen sixty. Well, this was this was um, in the summer of nineteen seventy three. The Baja Highway was under construction, and we had heard it was, it was almost a big com- deal. Yeah, it was a huge deal because you know years and years of dirt roads, and we had heard that it was nearly finished. My dad actually sold his last four wheel drive, and bought a, a Ford station wagon, and he decided he would modify it and have. Uh, air shocks added, an extra gas tank, because there'd be great distances between gasoline sources. But um, uh, we made that for the trip to go to Loretto and do some fishing out of Loretto. Well, as it turned out, the highway was still a long ways from being completed. There was a a good couple hundred miles of dirt road still. And um, uh, we got to the end of the pavement about uh, 40 miles from El Rosario. And Boy, that was kind of a neat adventure. Well, I recorded all the mileages of detour, construction, and then the old section of the old original dirt road that we'd driven on in 66 and recorded all those notes and mileages and decided I would self-publish a little booklet so anyone that needed the latest information on the highway before it was completed uh, could uh, have that reference. And boy, I I couldn't believe how well it sold out. I... uh, my uh, brother-in-law was a, a bank, uh, worked at a bank, and he was had access to a copy machine. My sister typed it up, and I made these, I got these old yellow jacketed uh, covers and hand wrote the title of it, Baja on the Trans Peninsular Highway. And I sold every one I could put together. I finally got tired of making them. And the highway was finished, and they were still selling. I, said, I had little update notes added to the later editions of it. And it was on TV. Channel 8 in San Diego had a morning show called Sun Up. And it was it was shown on that show. I was in school, so I couldn't see it, but uh, it still got some good publicity. A newspaper uh, article wrote about it. So, and where would people find it? Was it mail order from you? No, or it was, well, not in those days. There, you know, it was, word of mouth. It was. Uh, it could have been word of mouth, but it had it in two bookstores in Escondido. Well, that's true. On, on, on consignment, and they, they they happily sold them. I just made them up after school and like, took them to the bookstore. <laughs> a glimpse into the mind of David Keir, and you're still working on those sort of ideas, right? You're right. still saying, I need to do a book on this, and you were doing hand-drawn maps back then when you were in high school, and you're still interested in cartography. It, tell, tell me about your book on the missions. Okay, so the book on the missions... Uh, Read came, us the title, and I'll post it all in the show notes. Certainly. It's Baja California Land of Missions. It was published in 2016, and it's now in its eighth printing. Wow. The book, awesome. The book continues to sell. It's popular. I did a great job on it, if I do say so myself. And the purpose of it was uh, my interest in details and accuracy uh, lent itself to have me, you know, do something that was uh, available to the masses, if you will, the Baja interest people, that provided the true and correct information on the missions, plus a lot of details that aren't out in any books yet, except for mine, uh, latest discoveries and, and findings of uh, what the Padres wrote and what was done down in Baja. So I wanted to correct errors made by earlier books and make it in a very user-friendly, easy-to-read format that gave a brief history of each mission and you know how it was that 
that Baja California became Baja California because it was actually California first. Baja is where California began. And through the name changes and the acquisition of Upper California by the United States, uh, Baja California lost its original name, and now it's Baja California instead of just California. Right. So I right. explain that in the book. And how did you travel to do your research? I'm assuming you've been to these missions. You've been to the the remaining missions. Well, you've, you know, even the, the ruins of the missions. Right, you've been right. To... I've, I've been to every mission except one. Uh, and the one mission that I hadn't been to requires like two days of horseback riding to get to. And um, that's up in the mountains of Baja, San Pedro Martir. When are we going? <laughs> exactly. We should do it. Uh, but my, my publishing partner, who's Max Carrillo, is very well known. He's been on Huell Hauser's TV show a couple times. Um, he had been there and wrote an, uh, quite a detailed article about it. So between him and, and friends of mine that had actually gone there and photographed it, I could uh, honestly say I had plenty of information to include that. So I have all 27 missions, and I've been to all of them except that one mission personally. Wow. wow. And driving to them, camping, or you buy a mule, buy a horse? <laughs> no. how, how did you get no, to I'm, most I'm, of these? No, I'm, I'm easy going. I'm a car, I'm a car okay. camper. All my stuff all right. comes out of the back of my, my Tacoma truck now. And so uh, I tent camp or just camp on a cot under the stars. Uh, and, uh, that's how I do it. And either camp and once in a while we stay at a motel, you know, freshen up and there's great motels in Baja, like at El Rosario has Baja Cactus and San Ignacio has a La Huerta and, you know, nice places. And tell me about, remember, remind me of the owner of, um, Antonio, Baja, Antonio, Antonio Munoz, Ma- yeah. Antonio, I can see his face. I can see the picture of, uh, uh, Antonio and Ted and I standing in front of the, in front of the fire trucks, um, that he's, I took he, a year ago and I just was blanking on his name. He's nice, a wonderful, nice man. He's does, a wonderful human being. Yeah. He does yeah. his, uh, his angel work, which is just, you know, amazing bringing the, uh, the firefighting equipment and the first responder equipment, the, the, um, emergency vehicles. That's the word I'm looking for. The emergency vehicles down to help uh, motorists who have been in accidents. And that just, it just shows me like what one person can do. He he knew there was a need because of a great void between El Rosario and almost Aguero Negro. You right. know, that's nearly 200 miles of really nothing to help anyone that needed it. And so he's getting a, he has a radio network now with ham repeaters, I guess. And it's just, uh, you know, to make sure that people get help. Yeah. As we were talking about the fellow who had the the turtle farm previously, you know, helping the the uh, helping the turtles. Right. Again, one person can make a difference, especially in a place like Baja. One person really can, you know, get some things done. Exactly. So tell me more. So um, old missions. Yeah. Well, the old missions the book. Uh, the before before my book on just the Baja missions, Max Carrillo and I did a book on all the missions of both Californias in the correct order they were founded, not based on a line that didn't exist. Because you can see books about the Upper or Alta California missions, and there's now books about the Baja California missions. But there was no line separating them. They were all California missions. Loretta was the first mission, not San Diego. So we wanted a book that represented the actual true founding order of the missions. And that's what the old missions of Baja and Alta California did. And that was in 2012. Then I decided to have a detailed book on just the Baja missions, which was greatly needed, as I mentioned earlier. And this year, we've done a new edition of that uh, old missions book, changed the title name slightly, and, uh, and readdressed it to, to, because it was a very popular book with some brief history of each mission, photographs. And my latest project, I guess it's my latest project, um, which hopefully will get published this year, but the COVID-19 situation is kind of delayed a lot of things, is with Baja Bound uh, Mexican Auto Insurance uh, doing a new guidebook uh, with them and a series of maps. And um, so it's the Baja Bound Road Guide, and the title might change. But uh, I have gone through Baja in 2017 and 2018. Uh, so many of the popular roads and noting all of the kilometer markers, which are great reference points to find turnoffs and stuff on the highways, and where there are no kilometer markers, then the odometer mileage readings, like in the good old days, and um, GPS mapping and so forth. And what I'm showing you right now is a rough pre-publication version of it. Um, it's going to look really nice. There's a fellow back on the East Coast that is putting it together in a professional book format. So... Um, 
Hopefully, uh, Baja Bound will be able to get back on its feet after the slowdown in sure. business and get this thing published so people can have uh, a new guidebook to Baja, and I'm happy to be a part of that. That's great. That's great. It's, uh, you know, as you know, my, my Baja adventure buddy, Ted Donovan, he and I had so, so much fun in my old Land Cruiser on the Baja XL just using the Baja, you know, almanac, just saying, we're just going to do this with paper maps and people, everybody's got GPS and sophisticated stuff. Now it's, it's awesome to have, uh, I like, something I like that's, maps. Yeah. Something yeah. that's tangible. It's in your hands and maybe we're dating ourselves or something, but it is, I think really valuable, especially in a place like Baja, if, you know, if you yeah. don't have access to, uh, the internet or the cell reception or whatever, you can, Take a look in the old book. It's a sad. good old-fashioned book. It's sad that, like the Automobile Club, we had a, a great uh, Baja folding maps, very handy, and they stopped printing those back in 2010. So it's like, you know, the folding map or a map book is just a wonderful thing to have and look at. I mean, you don't have to have any cell phone reception. You don't have right. to have any electricity. It's it's a map on paper. It's like yeah, and Earth. I think I think there is something to that tangible um, that you can hold in their hand. I just bought a couple of those AAA maps uh, off of eBay. Actually, they were on, and nobody was bidding on them. And I thought, you know, I really loved those, and I'm sure my dad still has a few of them. If I was scrounging around in his garage, I could find them. But uh, I didn't have any of them, and uh, you know, to have a pair of those, I have one with me on this trip. Um, it's really a great thing. You can lay it out on your kitchen table, and you can see the whole, you know, the whole peninsula there and i think it's, it helps it's a the, beautifully the brain done thinks better by looking at it rather than flash pages on an electronic screen i just yeah, think I'm it records you. better i'm with you on that uh when's your next trip where are you going when are you well, going well <laughs> we had actually two tv uh uh we had one tv show trip planned for this year and that got canceled um so whenever we can reschedule it we're going to do a four-wheel drive trip to mission santa maria um for a um an amazon tv show called in for low um and if that still goes on we'll be having an episode of that um and i'm always available to cameron Steele for his mm -hmm. trail emissions i've done a lot of work with cameron in helping him design some of his trips uh, some information sheets for his guests and um, i was with cameron and his crew on the trail emissions recon of 2019 that was fantastic we were together for six days and to have someone like kurt leduc mm -hmm. be your driver in a, in a 100 plus mile an hour ford raptor on those dirt roads was pretty exciting for me and so <laughs> yeah you can see those uh, on youtube are the, yeah, uh, the recon I'll have, to, I'll have to take a look at those yeah kurt leduc's a guy that i just got to know a little bit through the uh, last um nora race and i'll be seeing him hopefully in october for the mexican 1000 and i look forward to spending some time uh, having him shepherd Ted and I in our old truck. Uh, you know, Kurt, Kurt's a really great human being. I really enjoyed. I really got to know him, and uh, he just, just I think he's a real down to earth person. A lot of fun. Yeah, I, I think I just need to jump into his passenger seat and say, "Hey, Kurt, take me for a scare." Do what you <laughs> tell him. Tell him. Do what you David, did to David Keir. <laughs> David Keir sent me. Take me for a good scare, Kurt. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're uh, rolling up here um, on just over a half hour. I won't take up too much of your time. Um, and I really want to say thanks for making uh, open your home and making some time to talk about our mutual passion. Um, before we wrap up, though, David, I'd really like to say so lucky that your dad was an adventurer and took you to Baja in the early 60s. And you've been at it now for we're talking about 50 years here. You've been going to Baja. Right. What has changed and what has stayed the same for you? Well, what stays the same is pretty easy because that's what I still go back for is is uh, the nature, uh, natural uh, situation that you find when you go to beaches and canyons and desert. When you can just be one with with the land, one with the ocean, and that's never going to change as long as you can get to those places away from the paved roads, away from the people, masses of people. Sure, have friends along, have family along. And then, then you also have the other great thing about Baja that hasn't changed are the people that live in the ranchos or the fish camps. Because once you're one on one knowing those people, they make you part of their family. They share everything they have with you. If you need something, like you've broken down or whatever, they do anything to help you out, even if it impoverishes them further. And they're just an amazing people. So that hasn't changed. So those are the good things about Baja the land and the people of Baja. 
you know, what has changed that we don't you know like as much are, are fences. There's there's way too many fences now in Baja, and there there are way too many locked gates. There's a couple of missions now that are are uh, places that are locked off. One's a beautiful rock art site, and another's one of the missions has got a gate now in front of it uh, that you can't get to easily. So it's you know those things happen. Uh, there's crime in certain places, but I avoid cities. Baja, I love the cities of La Paz and Loreto. Ensenada, but you know, I'd rather be out in the country. I'd rather camp under the stars. So Baja, I think, will always be that to me. And are the stars really better? And are the stars really brighter? And the tacos better in Baja? Twice, <laughs> <laughs> twice as better, twice as brighter, twice as good. That's I'm quoting Joy Lewis, who said that in a recent podcast. The stars are brighter, and the tacos are better in Baja. <laughs> so Joy, that's a shout out to you. Um, but I think you're right, and you say it's she's right. Twice as twice as good at least yeah and wrapping up here you had mentioned san pedro de matir Mm -hmm. have you spent much time up in that country i've been up to the observatory several times the first was in 1972 and the last time was uh when i was working on the new guidebook in uh, 2017 and it's very cold up there even in the summer for camping right. yeah no it's it's very much pine forest it looks like you could be in alta california you know in oh, some oh it's beautiful some yeah. northern part of uh, logging country or something it right. really is really very different than the rest of baja it is it's it's an, it's a uh, uh, an island if you will it's a an uh, a unique location and uh, uh, graham mackintosh wrote about it very well in his book near my dog to thee right. and uh uh, it's just, it is, it's the Baja Sky Island, I think is how he termed it. And it is definitely special. And we see condors flying overhead. Right. You, you can't get over that. That's, that's, that's something else. got to be something that's just amazing. Yeah, I've driven up there, but I haven't seen the, I haven't had the, the glory of seeing the condors. In closing, what would you tell somebody who's taking their first trip to Baja? I would say, have an itinerary of things you'd like to see, a list, but don't need to stick to it. Don't think you have to go by that and stay there a certain number of days. Be open to changes. Stay longer if you want to. Leave a place if you don't care for it, but do not stick to your itinerary. Just have a plan of ideas you want to go to, but be open-minded and just enjoy it because everything always works out when you go on to a Baja trip. Even if you have problems, everything works out and it makes a great story at the campfire on a future trip. And where are you starting? Where are your resources when you're doing your online research? Where would you send somebody straight away? Like, you're going to go to the internet and you're going to go to... Oh, go to my website, vivabaja.com. All right. Now we're, now we're talking. We're getting the plug in. That's the important part. And I'll have that in the show notes, of course, but vivabaja.com. Yeah, I've got, I've got many, many links to other people's websites that have interesting articles, uh, links to uh, my trip, my trips from the past, so you can see photos of places, so you can get an idea if you'd like to go to where I like to go in Baja. And uh, lots of maps. I got great new map center from past and present with zoomable features. So uh, I love maps. So as many maps as I could get on it, I thought it would be of use. And plus the, uh, the great old maps in the Lower California Guidebook. So it's a flashback to the 1960s before the highway was paved. Right. And you're findable. I mean, I've found you. You're on the Internet. People can find you easily. And you're, yeah. you're accessible. That's what I'm trying to right. say. You're accessible. Oh. And you've been very kind to me and pointed out a couple of recent uh, things on my Facebook, a link that didn't work and a, a mistake that I had on a mission. So people can find you via Facebook on, on what... Um, what well, I, I have a, actually have a Facebook group page. Okay. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, facebook.com slash old missions uh, is my main page. But the group page on that site is uh, where you can join our group and really discuss the missions and see lots of okay. photos. And that's all. On, you can get the links on vivabaja.com. All right. They're all Perfect. linked on the front page of that. And I think I found you in the Baja Visitor Group that... Uh Ted's active. In. Yeah, and Ted, li- Ted likes, he posts some of my photos there, and we, we exchange a lot of information. I've known Ted for a lot of years, and... and You're uh, wearing a I've shirt been, right now, the Baja Talk I've been, Radio. I got to look at the Baja Talk Radio shirt on, so that you stands the out. last two that on those shirts, you know, before <laughs> podcasts. It's, uh, that was a pretty gutsy uh, uh, thing to go out and do live internet talk radio. Pioneering Baja talk, yeah. I enjoyed it. All right, well, David, I appreciate you making some time for me and Slow Baja and talking to us about your passion, uh, the missions and traveling in Baja. So thank you very much. My pleasure. uh, Look forward to seeing you in Baja soon. I hope to be there soon. All right, cheers. Hey, you guys know what to do. Uh, Please help us by subscribing, sharing, rating, all that stuff. And if you missed anything, you can find the links in the show notes at slowbaja.com. 
I'll be back before you know it. And if you want to receive notices on new episodes, please follow Slow Baja on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for you old folks. 